Hello, aviation operations students. I would like to introduce you to Beverly Bunch. She is a professional safety engineer who has worked in the aviation industry as well as other industries. Beverly, welcome. Uh, Hello. You're here to share your story with, with my students so they can learn a little bit about the safety field. Go ahead. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I am an environmental health and safety professional. It used to be called a safety engineer. And what I do is protect not only workers, but also the community from harm, uh, whether it be physical or health hazards. Right now, I own and manage my own environmental health and safety consulting company called Custom Safety. I'd like to take you on a journey that will hopefully be motivating as you pursue your career within aerospace. Now, of the numerous jobs, and I do mean numerous <laughs> jobs I've had in the safety field, I've undertaken, uh, I've been doing this for about 45 years, and there were five that stood out. The first one was my job at the Nevada nuclear test site. The second was a position at Lockheed Martin. The third was my work at the chemical demilitarization training facility. And the fourth was my job at Boeing in the state of Washington. So how did I become a safety engineer extraordinaire. <laughs> in 1975, economic and social conditions, believe it or not, minus the COVID-19 pandemic, were very similar to what's happening right now. Despite the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act and labor law, employment discrimination persisted for people of color, women, and immigrants. So it was tough finding a job. And after my daughter was born, I started looking for jobs in the construction industry because I suspected they paid a lot better than most. But every time I went to the construction union hall about job opportunities, I was taunted. I was literally, the, the people in the office laughed when they saw me drive up and I could see them they, they were laughing so much their heads would be on the desk and they would be banging on their desk. And then as I walked in the door, they'd stop. But I wouldn't give up. I still kept coming at least once a week to ask if they had jobs. So finally, they told me about a safety engineering position. It was a safety engineer trainee position. And this level, this entry level position required a bachelor's degree and either work, previous work in the construction or manufacturing industries. So I had a bachelor's degree. Actually, my major in undergraduate school was German and French. I had a double major in German and French. And I, I learned Spanish because I, I studied in Mexico and in Puerto Rico. So, so that was okay. And to make it through school, to help pay for my, uh, my work in, in undergraduate school, I worked in a lot of factories during the summer and sometimes uh, uh, part-time. So I had the qualifications. And then courtesy of the, what was called CETA back then, CETA was a, a law that was an, a, a federal law that was enacted by Congress and signed by President Richard Nixon and, and this law said that uh, it, it, was, it was enacted to train workers to, and provide them with jobs, job opportunities in the, public, uh, in the public sector. So one of these jobs was the safety engineer training position at the Nevada test site. So I was very lucky. And you know, there may be some opportunities like that now, but uh, you just have to seek them out. I worked at the Nevada test site in uh, Mercury, Nevada. It's just, it's about a mile, uh, I'm sorry, about an hour outside of Las Vegas. 
while they were still having underground nuclear tests. Uh, my duties included exposures to tunnels. Uh, I had to go into tunnels and mines like a miner. I went on drill rigs, uh, mobile cranes. I did heavy construction work, again, in a safety capacity. I fought fires. Now, I actually did fight fires. Uh, I had to suit up in the, in the, um, I can't think of what it's called, but it's a firefighter gear <laughs> and fight fires. I had to uh, perform radiation monitoring after there was a, a nuclear blast. I learned system safety engineering, learned how to train and perform first aid. So it was an excellent opportunity and I, I'm glad that I was at the right place at the right time. This particular job at the Nevada nuclear test site catapulted, catapulted my career into safety. And I, I have to admit the pay was phenomenal. Even for back then, it was, it was great pay. Did I mention that I was the only safety engineer who was a woman and of color? So that's also been something that's happened through every single job. I'm usually the only woman safety person and the only person of color. <clears throat> I, I found safety or I still find safety uh, pro, uh, thought provoking, challenging, and again, um, a way to make a lot of money. So I, I decided to go back to school and get it. I received an associate degree in occupational safety from Clark County Community College in uh, North Las Vegas. And then I worked on and received my master's degree in safety from the University of Wisconsin, Stout in Menominee, Wisconsin. Then I was off to more safety adventures. My next memorable position was with Lockheed Martin in Chesapeake, Maryland. I was a senior safety engineer there. And it was uh, at first because it was aerospace, it was very intimidating. And the other thing, it, there were a lot of unknowns because Lockheed Martin's products are, are unique. Uh, usually their customer is the defense department of defense. So there are things you wouldn't see in the, in the private sector. So after getting rid of my insecurities, I found myself actually perusing the tooling and the building engineering drawings for safety, uh, fire and military specifications um, to make sure they were in compliance. In addition, my uh, oversight or my work at Lockheed Martin included uh, investigating accidents, inspecting industrial hygiene tasks, working with composites, heat treating of metal, working uh, around the autoclaves for the Patriot missile project the vertical launch system for the Navy and the GE thrust reversers. So far, all the positions, the positions I have held paid very well and were challenging. I, I hope you hear what I'm saying. <laughs> the work pays very well, so that's why I, I stick with it or I stuck with it. The next memorable job was uh, safety and health leader and it was with another defense contractor. And this defense contractor destroyed chemical weapons like nerve agent and mustard gas. This job was all about environmental uh, hazards and environmental waste. So there was a lot of, uh, ha I had, had a lot of hazwapper duties. Now I didn't mention something uh, in most of my jobs um, environmental 
responsibilities were included. But one employer I had forced me, I was kicking and screaming because I didn't want to go to law school for environmental uh, law. But I went and it's been a, a benefit to me because I know environmental laws really well. So this one, this particular job at the, the chemical demilitarization training facility was one where people, I trained people who were required to wear level A uh, suits. They, they look like moon suits, you know, um, you're totally encapsulated. And they actually sealed people. I had to seal people in the suits like you would a, a seal a meal so, so that they would be protected uh, from the chemical agents they were they were um, d getting rid of. This job also required that I I fly over to the Hague to the um, OPCW, the Organization for the Pro Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. This is in the Netherlands, and I had to train the chemical weapons inspectors that were a part of NATO countries. Um, this job was really neat and I did it for longer than any of the other jobs that I had. So, so uh, it, it, I smile when I think of uh, some of the things I, I learned and what I did there. Now, my last memorable position was an aerospace position and this was senior safety engineer contractor at Boeing in Everett, Washington. Prior to Boeing's 787 problems, it, seems anyone, it seemed anyone with their sights on an aerospace career has worked or wanted to work for Boeing. And at Boeing, I was the 777X Senior Environmental Health and Safety Consultant. Over the years, I, I, I noticed that I, I know what my specialty is uh, startups. So when there's a new project where, where there's still, a, there's no, no footprint, I'm the one who likes to come in and, and figure it out. And the 777X project was that. The 777, at, at the manufacturing, aerospace manufacturing plants, they actually uh, separate each part of the plane and the safety engineers work on a specific, specific part of the plane. Um, I worked on wings and the people who were in the little area I was in worked on wings, but I was the only one who was willing to work on uh, the 777X wings because it was so new. Um, I saw everything from the building of the tooling, there was like uh, a large plot of just cement. And I had to work with the contractors who were designing and building the tooling for the wings. And these wings for the 777X were built differently. Most of wings for planes are built uh, vertically. They're built vertically and the, the workers climb up the wings almost like a ladder or a scaffold so that they can rivet uh, the parts together. But on the 777X, uh, the wings were built in what's called the horizontal build line. And so the wings come in horizontally on robots and robots do a lot of the riveting and uh, everything is horizontal so that there are less falls and it minimizes some of the other hazards too. Um, the Boeing Everett plant, there's another thing, the Boeing Everett plant is the largest building in the world based on usable space. So it's such a huge, it's such a huge uh, building and it, it looks like a city within a city. There are Cars can actually run, <laughs> drive in and out of there. And uh, in addition to the, the, the carts and things that the most workers have, there are 
lots and lots of restaurants and Starbucks inside the facility and health facilities. Um, they have a store, the Boeing store. So it's a huge place, very, very big. Um, the, the main takeaway I think I have for this is it was a startup and I, I love that. The, um, the future of safety looks good. I think the, the future of aer uh, aerospace is also looking good despite some of the, the hiccups that Boeing's having. It's, it's a really good field to pursue. Now, safety, the whole profession is growing by leaps and bounds. Although the COVID-19 uh, pan pan pandemic has devastated many industries, the opposite seems to be occurring within the safety profession. I noticed there's a, there's a small indicator there was a small indicator to me when I would hear ordinary people understand what the uh, initials PPE mean. Um, then I knew that COVID-19 has actually opened people's eyes about uh, a safety, a safety um, provision or something that's important in safety, which is uh, personal protective equipment. Um, now, I hope you you can link all of this together and understand that um, safety work has been, um, it's been my life, and it also is very, it, it keeps you, it keeps your mind fresh, um, and, and I love doing it, and I still, that's why I still do it. But I've encountered a lot of barriers in, 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 this, in this profession, but I don't let those barriers crush my dreams. Often the only barriers to employment within this field are self-imposed. I realize that the profession was dominated by the few who placed barriers in my way, but I didn't let the bar barriers interfere with my goals. Um, I, I think that if you really want to succeed in a job, whether it be safety or aerospace, you need to study and read and make that your foundation because the more you know, the, the better you can make decisions. I found that another foundation for me was uh, my daughter. So family can be your foundation. My daughter, daughter was one of the major reasons why I never gave up. I wanted to give her a really good life with a good education and I was able to do all of that. You'd be surprised what she's done. <laughs> and uh, if, if you don't have those kinds of, of um, influences in your life, then try to find a mentor or somebody who makes the journey easier. And I, I actually found a really good mentor when I was in graduate school. So um, those are some of the ways you can avoid the pitfalls. And I think that that should uh, be all I wanna say. All right, thank you, Beverly. Uh, and one of the reasons Beverly's had a lot of jobs is her preference to be in startups. And so she builds the foundation and then moves on to another position. She has a lot of certification and everything, and we'll post it with this video because she didn't want to bore you with that. Beverly, thank you for sharing your story. Uh, you know, you've come a long way and you have done some amazing things in your life. Those are just a few of uh, the amazing adventures you've had. And thank you for your time. Thank you.